All right, well, we're going to talk about uh, the spiritual warfare with the King James Bible or with a, with a counterfeit Antichrist version. Hey, Ben. So uh, I, I, I want to bring this to you because I thought about the sword. And I thought about, you know, if we're going to talk about the sword of the Spirit, man, we better know what sword we're talking about. Amen. And by the way, there's only one sword. Amen. And, uh, and there's a lot of false counterfeit swords out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of false counterfeit weapons out there that, wouldn't, that don't pass, that can't work, that don't work with the King James Bible. Amen. But these modern day anti-Christ, I call them anti-Christ versions. Amen. And you're going to find out why I call it an anti-Christ version. You know, why do you call the NIV an anti-Christ version? Well, I'm going to show you. Why do you call the ESV or the ASV or any of these others? Why do you call them anti-Christ versions? Why, why does it matter? Well, I'm going to show you today why it matters. And it matters for your spiritual warfare, too. It matters if you're going to battle, if we're going to battle principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places, we better make sure we have, we have the sword. We have the sword, the word of God. Well, if you don't have the word of God, you're in trouble. You can go out with something you might call a Bible, but if it isn't the word of God, it doesn't matter. Amen. You've got to have the word of God. So 1 Samuel chapter 21 and verse number 9 says this, And the priest said, The sword of Goliath. The Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take it, take it. For there is no other save that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it me. David knew that there was nothing like that sword right there. And he wanted it. Amen. He wanted that sword. He said, there's nothing like it. I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing like the King James Bible. There is nothing. Whether it's the counterfeit new King James Bible which is corrected with the Alexandrian text, which is corrected with the same mistakes that are in the other versions. How about that? They just slap an N on it, and they try to get you to fall for it, right? And then most people fall for it. Well, it's a little bit easier to read. Really? Because when you start looking into that, they really aren't any easier to read. They're actually harder and more difficult to understand in a lot of ways, right? So we're going to talk about some of those things today, actually. Um, and I'm going to go through a few things with you here. But in spiritual warfare, it is very important which sword... You're using. If you're using the wrong one, it'll cost you dearly. How could we face devils and demons and principalities and wicked people out there? How can you face them and all the darkness of this world with a butter knife and not a sword? That's really what it, it's like. They have this butter knife. When I listen, when I compare the King James Bible with an NIV, an ASV, an ESV or any other HIV out there, when I, when I, when I compare it, what do I, what do I see? I see it's like comparing a butter knife to a sword. That's what it is. It, they're dull and they have no power. But you live in a day and age, well, well, nothing matters today, right? Oh, it doesn't matter. It's no big deal. I mean, whatever. It's all the Bible, isn't it? No. It's all the Word of God, isn't it? No, it's not. Amen? It's not. It matters. And in spiritual warfare, why do you think the devil, how, how has all the false doctrine been able to creep into all the churches the way it has? How? You tell me how. Well, I'm going I'm to share something with you, a few things here with you today. that I think you'll see how that's happened. And, I, and I'll, I'll submit to you, when people gave up this book, they brought every damnable heresy in you could imagine. And that's why it's wide scale. But that, by the way, they were warned, though. And I'm going to show you the warnings that preachers gave. There was a preachers that gave warnings that this was going to happen. When they, when they translated the, uh, what was it, the, uh, the RSV, is that what it is? The, the revised standard, no the, no, the revised version, excuse me, the RV, right? The revised version. When they did it, they gave a warning. They said, you know what, if you do this, this is going to happen. Every single thing they said was going to happen, happened. Right. Everything. God was using them to warn, and they didn't listen. They'd heed the warning. You better heed the warning. You go into, you go into spiritual battle with a butter knife and not a sword, you're going to be in trouble. You're not going to scare too many devils away with a butter knife. You need that sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Amen. And I think the devils laugh when they see modern perversions of the Scriptures. I think they laugh. Why? Because they're incomplete. They don't hold the power that the King James Bible does. They're without power, and the devil knows this. He knows it. Why do you think he promotes them so much? Why are they so popular? Why, why are they so popular? And why does the world love them? And why do they make so much money? Because they're worldly. They're of the devil. They're antichrist. All right. 
So number one, let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray you be with us now. Help us, Lord Jesus, as we look at your word versus the counterfeit false perversions that are out, antichrist versions that are out there today. Help us now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Number one, Satan doesn't want you having a final authority, but he wants absolute confusion in your life. Listen, Satan loves the confusion of modern versions. These modern, they've been called Vatican versions by Will Kinney and others that have studied the issue out. And he's right, they are Vatican versions, all of them are. Boy, I'll tell you what, we, I don't have time to go into this today, but man, there's a Jesuit on the, on, on the translation committees of all these that were working with these groups. Jesuits, Rome is involved in all these, and Rome's acceptance of all these are in there. You have one Bible that stands alone, and everybody is shooting at it. Because, I mean, no, I mean, that, that's the one, this is the one that they hate. Why? Well, because the others come from, it's, it's, it's a different, different DNA, amen, different makeup altogether, right? It's not the same makeup, not the same, not at all. In 1 Corinthians 14, the Bible says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. You know how much peace there was in churches concerning understanding of doctrine and things like that, and that there is a final authority before the revised version came out? Don't believe me? Okay, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll read something to you here. You know, doctrine cannot, before I get into this, doctrine cannot be settled today because if someone wants to believe something, all they have to do is find a Bible version that agrees with them and they can contradict the other one. And that's how they live in this mass state of confusion constantly. That's why churches can have all these other, all these interpretations and all, and, and that's why sin is not sin any longer. If you find the right Bible, something you're doing is not sin anymore. Amen. I'm telling you, you think it's facetious, but it's not. It's absolutely true. Everything I'm saying to you is absolutely true. You go out there and look at these versions and you will see the difference. Some of you think God have been spoiled upon the King James Bible. And what I mean that is you don't have anything else and you don't need anything else and you've never looked at anything else. But you better understand the issue and the difference. You better be able to, dis, uh, to, uh, uh, to discern those differences. But there was a preacher that talked about this. That there'd be no final authority like there is today. Joseph Philpot, a preacher, uh, he, was a, he was a Baptist pastor in, I believe it's Canada. And, uh, that he was, but he was, he was also an editor of Oxford, the Gospel Standard, 1857. He gave this warning about a revision of the authorized version. I want to read you this, his, his warning in its entirety here. Who are to undertake it? Of course, they must be learned men, great critics, scholars, and divines. But these are notoriously either tainted with popery or infidelity. Where are the men learned, yet sound in truth, not to say alive unto God, who possess the necessary qualifications for so important a work? And can erroneous men, dead in trespasses and sins, carnal and worldly, ungodly persons, spiritually translate a book written by the blessed spirit? We have not the slightest ground for hope that they would be godly men, such as we have reason to believe translated the scriptures into our present version. Number two. Excuse me, number two, again, it would unsettle the minds of thousands. Oh. As to which was the word of God, the old translation or the new? What a door it would open for the workings of infidelity or the temptations of Satan. What a gloom, too, it would cast over the minds of many of God's saints to have those passages which have been, had been applied to their souls translated in a different way and how it would seem to shake all their experience of the power and preciousness of God's word. How come it is that when somebody wants to fight against the King James Bible, their only desire is to absolutely destroy it? Listen to this, number three. But besides, this, besides all this, there would be two Bibles spread throughout all the land, the old and the new, and what confusion would this create in almost every place? At present, all sects and denominations agree in acknowledge, acknowledging our present version is to be the standard of appeal. Nothing settles disputes so soon as when the contending parties have confidence in the same umpire and are willing to abide by his decision. But this judge of all dispute, this umpire of all controversy, would cease to be the looser of strife if present acknowledged authority were put an end by arrival. So what's he saying? Once you do that, you have more than one umpire now. So now what settles it in the minds of people? That's right. They have to have a vote. You know why churches vote on so many things like that today? You know why? 
because they don't have the Bible. They have no authority. I don't have to vote on homosexuality here. Vote on that here. Why? Would, what's there to vote on? It's wicked. What's, what do you vote on? Or, or, or women being, being bishops or pastors? What's there to vote on? You're a bunch of usurping Jezebels. You don't have a right to be a pastor. Well, that's not very nice. I didn't intend it to be nice. I intended it to be mean. That's why I said it. Amen. You should try to be more calm when you say things like that. I should be nicer, shouldn't I? Yeah, I know, because the devil's so nice, and he, you know, he's playing patty cake with us. We should keep playing it with him. I'll be as nice as these Jezebels are that get in their pulpits and hate God and blaspheme his word and seduce his spirits, to, his prophets to sin. Right? Go home and make some cookies. All right. Amen. I meant that, every word of it, too. Absolutely every word of it I did. You can quote me on that. Brother Paul, did you hear that? See, you're nicer than me. You wouldn't see. You said last night you were nicer than me. He was a little bit nicer than me last night. Let me tell you what happened, okay? Let me, let me preface it now. This guy walked by me, and he was looking at my beard, and he was going like this. He was like, yeah, maybe you should shave this, and he's making fun of me and everything like that. I was like, well, maybe you should grow one. I was like, that's okay. Someday you'll grow up, son. You'll be able to grow one of these. I just walked away from him. That's all I said to him. <laughs> Paul looks at him and goes, I'm a lot nicer than him. <laughs> Thumb in the eye. <laughs> Who's nicer? Give me a break. You better repent of that, brother. <laughs> anyway. All right, no, I'm sorry. Anyway, number four. But by the, my point was, after I went on that rabbit trail here, my point with all that Jezebel stuff was this. We don't have to vote whether there's women pastors. The Bible already says the bishop is the husband of one wife. Amen? But what happens today, though? They have a different version that changes that, the gender-neutral virgin. Virgin. <laughs> virgin. <laughs> I'm tired. I didn't get any sleep. <laughs> anyway. The gender neutered version, I guess. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, the nutty idiots version. That's it's not very nice. You should try being nicer. All right, number four. If if the new translation were once to begin, where would it end? Boy, is that for sure. Look at that. It it is good to let well enough alone, as it is easier to mar than to mend. He said the Socian end would. Blot out God in 1 Timothy 3.16 and strike out 1 John 5.7 as an interpolation. The Puseyite would mend it to suit the Tractarian views. Once set up a notice, the old Bible to be mended and there would be plenty of workmen who trying to mend the cover would pull the pages to pieces. All our good Bible terms would be so mutilated that they would cease to convey the Spirit's meaning. And instead of the noble simplicity, faithfulness and truth of our present version, we should have a Bible that nobody would accept as the word of God to which none could safely appeal and on which none implicitly rely. And what do we have today? What do they say? There's no word. There's no perfect Bible out there. That's what they all say. They didn't say that back then. They say it now. There's no perfect Bible. No, I'm sorry. There is no perfect Bible. You ask him where you can find one, and you get nothing. I had a street preacher get upset with me this week because he started blasting the King James Bible, and I asked him where I could find the, the perfect preserved word of God. And he said, and he didn't answer me. He goes, could you describe, could you explain perfect? <laughs> Without error, infallible, perfection. Amen? That one. No errors, no mistakes. Can you, find, can you show me that one? They, they don't like it when you believe in that final authority. Not at all. Number five, instead of our good old Saxon Bible, simple and solid, with few words obsolete, and alike majestic and beautiful, we should have a modern, listen, a modern English translation in pert and flippant language of the day. Right? What do we have today? Look at all the modern, modern versions. They, what, are they, what are they? They're flippant. They're pert in the modern language, he said. How about the Message Bible? 
If that, that should be called, that should be renamed the Thug Bibles. If that should be called, that, 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 is, that is Thug Life Bible right there. That's, that is, man. I'm so, that is, man. That is just like a thug version. It is like a street thug version. If you read some of the verses in the Message Bible, oh, man, I'm telling you, they are bad. I can't remember one we were reading one day, Brother Nate. We read it on the radio or something. I don't remember what it was, but it was funny. Jesus got in a brawl with somebody. Yeah, there's just like a lot of, there's a lot of weird things like that that they say. But anyway, but he's right. That happened, didn't it? Sounds like a prophet, doesn't it? That's it? Doesn't he? That's what happened. Number six, the present English authorized version is we believe the grand bulwark of Protestantism, the safeguard of the gospel and the treasure of the church. And we should be traitors in every sense of the word if we confused, if we consented to give it up or to be rifled by the sacrilegious hands of Puseyites, concealed papist. Wait a minute. He's saying that there would be secret papists that would come in that wouldn't, that wouldn't say they were papists. They wouldn't say that they were, they were Catholic or Jesuits, but they would be, and that they would come on these committees and they would translate the Bibles. Now, did that ever happen? It did, didn't it? There was a few of them. What's the name of the two, two, two popular ones? Uh, well, Westcott and Hort, yeah, they were spiritists. And, but um, Eugene Ida, wasn't he with, didn't he work with Jesuits? And Carlo Martini, right. Both those two Jesuits worked on almost all the translations that are here today come out of, uh, out of their, with the, that they had their hands on. Yeah, United Bible Society. See? Well, I mean, he wasn't around then because this was 1857. Why, how did he know that? German neologians, he said, infidel, divines, Armenian, Socians, and the whole tribe of enemies of God and the godless, he said, would come after them, would come after those Bibles. And what happened? That's exactly what happened. They all came after the Bibles, attacked them, perverted them, and changed them. Philpot warned that biblical scholarship of the day was tainted with popery and infidelity. He warned that men who were unsound in the faith could not properly translate a spiritual book. Impossible. They can't do it, and we know this now. So that's, anyway, that was a warning from a preacher. Now, uh, next, modern versions that deny the deity of Christ. They deny the deity of Christ. They are what? They are antichrist. Turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse number 3. He said, I can't believe a Bible version could be antichrist. Well, I'm going to let the word of God speak, and then I'm going to show you what they do in the modern perversions, and you tell me if God is saying this is antichrist or not. doesn't matter what you and I think, if that's what the Bible says, then it's Antichrist, right? Plain and simple. We have an authority. It's the Bible. It's the King James Bible. It's the Word of God. Amen? 1 John 4, 3 says this, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now, already is it in the world. All right. So, I mean, plain and simple, isn't it? He says what? He says, if a spirit, any spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, it's Antichrist, right? All right. Well, let's look and see. Let's look and see what some of the modern versions do, okay? In the King James Bible, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14, the King James Bible says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive. Amen. In the RSV, it's that same passage says, Behold, a young woman shall conceive. Now, I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of young women, and they aren't virgins. Amen? In America today, they walk around on the streets. We're out there, and these young woman, women brag and tell you they're not virgins. And they mock and laugh and scoff virgins. So wouldn't that, isn't there a difference between a virgin and a young woman? Yeah, I'd say so. So the word of God says... Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That says, the RSV says, Behold, a young woman shall conceive. Not the same thing. Things are, that are different are not the same, right? Amen? All right, Luke chapter 1, verse number 34. Seeing I know not a man. King James Bible. The RSV, since I have no husband. Again, you see that? Since I have no husband, the RSV says. Wait a minute, there's a difference in somebody that has not known a man and that doesn't have a husband. 
There's a lot of women out there that don't have a husband that have known a man. See the difference? What are they doing? Doesn't it sound like this verse? And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. It's the Antichrist version. That's what it is. Amen. How about this one? Luke chapter 2, verse number 43. And Joseph and his mother. Luke 2, 43 says that in the King James Bible. And Joseph and his mother. Amen. What does the NASV and the NIV say? The child's father. Whoa, wait a minute. Joseph wasn't his father. Jesus said, wist you not that I must be? He said, Joseph. The, the, he, Mary said, thy father and I have, saw, have sought thee sorrowing. What did he say? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Who's his father? God, Jehovah God is his father in heaven. So... How then could he be called his father? It's not right. It's not the same. It's different. It's not the same. Amen. It's an antichrist. It's denying the deity of Christ. Very simple stuff. It's not even hard. All right. How about this one? This is their favorite. This is the heretic's favorite version right here. What they like to do with this. God, uh, the King James Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. Amen. First Timothy 3, 16. God was manifest in the flesh. NASV and NIV say he appeared in a body. Who appeared in the body? Wait a minute. What does that verse do? It denies the deity of Christ. What does it say? The NIV, the NASV, what does it say? He appeared in a body. Wait, the Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. He is God, manifest the flesh, destroying the deity. Then upon this verse in 1 John 4, 3, what does the Bible say? This is Antichrist. The Bible, doesn't the Bible tell us to try the spirits, whether they are of God? We're to try the spirits. So let me ask you a question. What is the spirit of the NIV and the NASV? Antichrist. See, the thing that you'll understand about this church, you'll get it black and white here. We won't play some gray, road, gray line in between. We'll just give it to you black and white. They're antichrist versions. We don't use them. We don't want anything to do. Well, we might use them to prove their error, but we're not going to, they're not our authority. We don't recognize their authority. They're of the devil. Amen. All right. Ephesians 3, 9, who created all things by Jesus Christ. The NASV, the NIV says this, God who created all things. Wait a minute. What happened to Jesus Christ? By Jesus Christ. Why, wait, why is Jesus gone? What happened? Destroying the deity of Christ. What are they? Antichrist. Antichrist. That's right. Very simple, very plain. How about Micah chapter 5, verse number 2? It says, from everlasting. What does the NIV say? Whose origins are from old, from ancient times. That's dad. He's from old, from ancient times. That could be anyone, right? Right? Yeah, whose origins are from old. Yeah, how does he have origins, right? Right. Right. So from everlasting, the King James says. And the NIV changes it to whose origins are from old, from ancient times. It is wicked. That's right. All right, so there's another one. So what is it, what it, what, upon that, what is this spirit? It's Antichrist. It's Antichrist. All right, this is a big one here. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 25. Huge one here, huge. Okay, listen to this. Is like the Son of God. What does the NASV and the NIV say? Looks like a son of the gods. Whoa. Well, now that's not the same thing at all. Nebuchadnezzar said, is like the Son of God, didn't he? Yeah, who was in the fire? The fourth man in the fire, who was it? Is like the Son of God, right? That's the fourth man in the fire, is like the Son of God. There's Brother Russ, three are the same and one is different, right? Huh? I was listening, Brother Russ. Right. Looks like a son of the gods. 
Maybe he was Thor? Yeah, maybe in that version he was Thor. I don't know. All right, here's another one. 1 John 3, 16, the love of God because he laid down his life for us. The, NI, the NASV and the NIV, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. What do they take out? They take out the deity of Christ being God. They, they remove it. They remove Christ being God. Why is there so many attacks on the deity of Christ in these modern perversions? Why do they pull them out? Why do they change them? Why do they take them away? Because they're antichrist. The Bible says, and by the way, I don't even care why they did it. It doesn't matter. You have to divorce yourself from any of those feelings of nonsense. Who cares why they did it? I don't care if they thought they had good reasons. They perverted the word of God and they're antichrist. That's what they did. Plain and simple. All right, one more here. Oh, excuse me, no, two more here. Romans 14.10, the King James Bible says, the judgment seat of Christ. The NASV and the NIV says God's judgment seat. Right. Take it out. Pervert it. Why? Why are they doing that? Yeah, exactly. They want to destroy the deed of Christ. In the NIV, Titus chapter 2, verse number 13 says, The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The, K the King James Bible in Titus 2, 13 says, The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What's the difference there? In the King James reference above, that is used the reference to the great God because there is only one great God. This fact holds true whether a person accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior or not. There's only one God. However, the word are used in the reference of the Savior because although he is the great God, he may not be an individual's personal Savior. So the King James Bible shows that he must be he is the great God, but he must be our personal Savior. He's not everybody's Savior, right? No, he's just those that are born again. So you see, there's an attack on this. There's an attack on, there's a lot of attacks on salvation and everything else. These modern perversions, they deny that. I'll give you another one here. They attack Jesus Christ, the person himself. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 16. Turn there, please. You're going to see an attack here that they've done. In the NIV, you'll see it's actually Isaiah. You can turn to Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12, if you'd like. But uh, either way, um, Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Isaiah 14, 12 in the King James says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which just weakened the nations? So the book of Revelation correctly identifies Jesus as the morning star. Now look at the one the NIV blasphemously cites as having fallen from heaven. It is no longer Lucifer, but Jesus Christ, the morning star. The NIV in Isaiah 14, 12 says this, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you, you who once laid low the nations. Wait a minute, what happened there? I thought Jesus Christ was the morning star. He is. But they make, it, they, they make it to be Satan. They change it. They pervert it. Stealing from his deity. Stealing from him and changing who he is. Why? Why would you want to... Let me ask you a question. Would it be an antichrist version to confuse Jesus and, and, and Satan? What would that be? Well, that'd be antichrist, wouldn't it? Because if I was trying to fool you to believe that the coming, that Lucifer was really the, what do we hear from Antichrist and occultists? They really say, well, Lucifer is the real Christ. He's the real coming one. He's the real good one. Right? He's the, re he's the one that got the raw deal. He's the one that they're going to bring up out of the pit. You know, he's the one that they're going to bring out of the kingdom. He's the one that's going to bring on the satanic kingdom or whatever, the enlightenment of the age, the golden age, right? He's going to bring it about, right? They, what are they doing? They're perverting it. They want to pervert the doctrine of Christ. What does the Bible say about those that pervert the doctrine of Christ? It says they're accursed. We're to have no fellowship with them. I'm, I'm not going to have any fellowship with these, these modern perverts. Not, not, not in this world, not for anything. All right. 
Sounds like Antichrist. That's right, the NIV is Antichrist. How can you go into spiritual warfare? Let me ask you with an Antichrist version. How can you do it? Can Satan cast out Satan? So then we see the deity of Christ being absolutely destroyed. So how can we fight with that? How can we fight? With, if it truly is the sword of the Spirit, with it we are to make war forever against Satan. It would stand to reason, I need all of it, don't I? The Trinity omitted from modern versions as well. Um, I'll read you some of these, okay? The Trinity is omitted from many of the modern, uh, modern versions, like we talked about 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on the earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Most modern translations, the, the NAS, the NIV, the RSV, the NLT, and the LB, whatever that is, on the other hand, are based upon the Alexandrian-type text tradition, Sinaiticus and Vatican, Vat Vat I can't, Vat <laughs> thank you, Vaticanus, thank you. These versions commonly read as the NIV does. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. Wait a minute, what's missing? The Trinity. The Trinity's missing. By the way, I had a guy tell me this the other day. Uh, he was that same thread with that street preacher. He got on there and argued, yeah, and the King James has a mistake because it puts in First uh, John chapter 5, verse number 7 and, and 8 there, or verse number 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And the oldest manuscripts don't have that. Oh, and I'm sure you've read the oldest manuscripts, haven't you? I'm sure you've seen them, right? Yeah, you got those, huh? That's right. After I showed him the truth, what happened? Pew. No? Yep. No, it's not the one that was used either. All right, so anyway, so, so they destroyed the Trinity, right? What is that? It's Antichrist. How can I go to war with a book that's Antichrist? I can't fight like that. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 21, completely removed, also deleted from the Jehovah's Witness Bible. So what are you NIV readers missing? This verse. I wonder why this verse. Now, why would this verse be missing? Are you ready for this? Turn there. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 21. I want you to turn there. It's a very important verse. Actually, we're going to be talking about it on Wednesday. Now, if I was going to go to spiritual warfare, I, I need, for victory, I need to have the proper tools, right? Because our weapons are not carnal, but they're spiritual to the pulling down of the strongholds. Amen? Well, what, what's being left out? What's Satan leaving out of the NIV? Here you go. Are you there? And I'm going to, hold on, I'm not going to do it electronically. I'll do it this way here, okay. All right. All right, Matthew chapter 17, verse number 21 says this, how be it this kind, well actually let me back up to verse number 20, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now verse number 21 is left out. How be it this kind goeth not forth, not, not out, but by prayer and fasting. Well now wait a minute. What would happen if you came across you know, you, you, you come into a block with the devil, right? And, you, and you're battling the devil's kingdom. And the Bible says, you know what? Some things in your life sometimes, we're going to talk about that in spiritual warfare. It's not just street preaching. Obviously, it's everything in our lives, right? It's everything. But you and I, when we war a good warfare, what happens? We need, we need sometimes we need to fast and pray, don't we? Right? Because what does the Bible say? These kind come not forth but by prayer and fasting. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Well, that's gone. That's gone. Well, the NI, that, that's kind of dangerous, isn't it? Because if there's something that I can't get past without prayer and fasting, but the devil takes it. Now, why would Satan want to take the opportunity, the tool away from me, the, the, the warfare, the, the, the weapons of my warfare away from me? Well, I'll tell you why. So you couldn't battle him and you wouldn't get the victory and you'd lose. Sounds like gun control. That's right. What does he take away from you? Imprecatory prayer and fasting. Praying against his wicked kingdom and fasting. 
Well, wonder why he'd want to take those two away from you. Why is he placed in the mind of people to think imprecatory prayer is bad? Right, Brother Nate? Why? So you don't pray against his wicked kingdom, and you don't pray the judgment of God come over wickedness, and you don't pray against evil. And then now I don't want you to fast either. Why? Because these kind don't come out by prayer and fasting. So if I keep you from fasting and I keep you from praying, then guess what? You lose and he wins. He's scared of them, so he takes them out. The NIV further attacks the doctrine of fasting. Through the word fa the, though the word fasting is not removed entirely, the important doctrine that fasting is, is, is an essential part of spiritual warfare is removed. In this context, the NIV omits the entire verse of Matthew 17, 21, plus the word fasting in Mark chapter 9, verse number 29. Turn there, Mark chapter 9, verse number 29. Got to hurry up here so I can get done. Again, and he said of them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So he removes fasting. The word fasting in Mark 9.29 in the NIV. In Acts chapter 10, verse number 30, I can't go through all these, you'll have to go through them later. In Acts chapter 10, verse number 30, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 5 and 2, and in Corinthians, in, or excuse me, verse number 5, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5, and in 2 Corinthians 11.27. He removes the word fasting. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you would almost think that, I know, I, I know, I, we get told this. You're one of those conspiracy guys, aren't you? Yeah, when you translate that word, there's a spirit. Yeah, there's, yeah, I am. I actually am one of those guys, yeah. Yeah. I had somebody tell me, you're kind of paranoid. Okay, call me whatever you want to. But yeah, there's a, yeah. There's a conspiracy against the King James Bible, the Word of God. And they want to take out, fa and the devil wants fasting out of the Bible. And why does he want it out of the version they're using? Because if he takes it out of the version they're using, they can't fight him, and they're not fighting him, and they're not using the weapons of their warfare. Right? So what do we have churches doing today? Using the carnal weapon, using carnal weapons to try to fight the devil. And what are they doing? Losing. So they take this butter knife of an NIV or an NASV or any other perversion and they take this butter knife out against Satan and Satan laughs at him. Makes sense, doesn't it? Some devils only go out but by prayer and fasting. Sounds like to me there's a lot of devil possession. Sounds like to me there's a lot of churches full of devils. Devils just aren't, aren't uh, out at Saturday night when you're preaching on the streets. There are a lot of churches today, right? Some of them are on translation committees and boards. Acts chapter 8, verse number 37, completely removed, also deleted from the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Its deletion makes one think that people can be baptized and saved without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds Catholic, doesn't it? So what are, you, what are the NIV readers missing? This is what they're missing. In Acts chapter 8, verse number 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Whoa! Wait a minute. So some guy's just getting baptized and he hasn't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. So what's it promoting? Baptismal regeneration and leaving out faith in Christ. So somebody just gets baptized and they're automatically saved. So the devil has another one deceived and on their way to hell, probably sealed into that fate. Hmm? Pretty shady, isn't it? Mark chapter 16, verse number 9 through 20, all 12 verses. There is a line separating the last 12 verses of Mark from the main text. Right under the line, it says the two most reliable early manuscripts do not have Mark chapter 16, verse 9 through 20. The Jehovah's Witness Bible also places the last 12 verses of Mark as an appendix of sorts. I wonder why. Let's go there. Why, why would the devil want those gone? Well, let's look at those and see why he'd want them gone. See if there's any important facts in those that, might, that the devil might not want you to read. All right, Mark chapter 16, verse 9 through 20. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast out seven devils. I can find two reasons why, right there why he doesn't want you to know that. 
Number one, Jesus rose from the dead, and we get the power of the resurrection. Doesn't want you to know Jesus rose from the dead. Number two, he doesn't want you to know that people can be delivered from devil possession. And seven devils at that. And clothed and in their right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. No, he don't want you to know that, does he? Don't you find that pretty interesting in spiritual warfare that if I was coming out with this butter knife of an NIV or any of these others that separate this and say, well, it's not really Bible, but we'll put it in there anyway. Well, you loser, why'd you even put it in there then? You hypocrite, if it's not Bible, leave it out, you coward. Don't put it in there and look like the idiot you are. Amen. I'm sorry, I have no grace for these people. They're sending people to hell with their modern perversions and their wickedness. People are sliding, going straight to hell, thinking they're religious all the way. I'm tired of seeing religious people go to hell. Innocent lambs that come to, to, to want the truth, and they're being deceived by wolves. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And, and, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. And after that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they, unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. These are all witnesses of the resurrection, so let's leave that out. It's just a few crazy, a handful of crazy people. It's nobody really believed in the resurrection. So let's just leave this out, right? Why? Because Satan knows there's power in the resurrection. That's why. It defeated him. Amen. Yeah. He didn't give him a big hug. No, he rebuked him, didn't he? He told him, what you, what's your problem? And he said to them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, I can see why you'd leave that out too. Because we definitely don't want the preaching of the gospel. Why? Because it defeats Satan. That's why he doesn't want the preaching of the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Yeah, he doesn't want that. Believeth not. By the way, you see how the concentration is on belief and not on baptism, right? See that? You know, Baptists get accused of a lot of things, but one thing you won't accuse us of is baptismal regeneration. We were the ones that never believed that garbage and that, and that doctrine from hell. Amen? And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out, in my name, excuse me, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Oh, well, we certainly don't want that in there, now do we? Because if we're an antichrist, we certainly don't want anybody knowing that they have power to cast out devils. We wouldn't want that in there, would we? No, we wouldn't want that in there, would we? And they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Well, we wouldn't want that in there either, would we? And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So we can't have those things in there, can we? We wouldn't want those 12 verses in there. You know, you have so many doctrines in there that we've already went over this. But anyway, you say the NIV says the most reliable manuscripts don't have that in there. You know, that's as good as saying if you accept this rendering, you are accepting an inferior, unreliable manuscript. What they don't tell you is that those same reliable manuscripts don't even include the whole book of Revelation. Well, that'd be important to know. They leave out the last 12 ver uh, verses of Mark, but they don't even include the book of Revelation. Those reliable manuscripts. They don't seem to be very reliable. Why'd they leave that little bit of information out, I wonder? That would be kind of important. Hmm? By the way, in Luke chapter, let, let's move on here because we, we got to get going here. But Luke chapter 23, verse number 42, the thief's testimony that Jesus is Lord is omitted. So, you know, it's just universal salvation, right? Just, right? Right? It's universal salvation. The thief's testimony that Jesus is Lord omitted. John chapter 1, verse number 14, verse 18, John 3, 16 and 18, only begotten son changed to one and only son. Wait a minute. God doesn't have one and only son. He has an only begotten son. I'm a son of God. As many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even then that believe on his name. Amen. We're sons of God, but we are not the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Begotten, what does that mean? Came from the Father. Well, why would we want to destroy that? 
It's kind of an important one to leave out, isn't it? I'm making all the kids cry today. They're just all crying. What, what happened? What did I do? Is it something I said? I mean, they're all like crying. I mean, I'm thinking we got to, man, I'm telling you, what's going on here? What's that? The nursery was closed today. That's what happened. Yeah, that's what happens when the nursery's closed. It's, it's, it's been closed for a few years now. How long has it been closed? About four years, Brother Russ? About four years. We shut her down four years ago and then opened it back up again. That's right, it's still under construction. Put a sign on it. Anyway, I've got to hurry. We've got to get out of here. All right. The NIV removes hell entirely from the Old Testament, replacing it with grave or death. The Old Testament word translated hell in the King James Bible is Sheol. It has more than one meaning. Most frequently, it refers to the dwelling place of the spirits of the dead. It is translated hell 56 times in the King James Bible. The same word also refers to the grave at times. It is translated grave in 29 verses in the King James Bible. The NIV makes no distinction between Sheol as hell or Sheol as the grave and always translates Sheol as grave or death. This is a great error. Consider some examples. Deuteronomy 32.22. The King James Bible says, For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn into the lowest hell. The NIV says, For a fire has been kindled by my wrath, one that burns to the realm of death below. Wait a minute. Fire does not burn in the realm of death in any sense other than in hell. So why not translate it hell? Since when do graves light on fire? Right? Fire's in hell. Job 11.8, the King James Bible, says it is, a, it is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what, what canst thou know? The NIV says, they are higher than the heavens, what can you do? They are deeper than the depths of the grave, what can you know? Wait a minute. The grave is not deep in comparison with heaven, and Job is not referring to the grave but the depths of hell. I mean, a grave's not that deep. Not compared to heaven. So what's the deal? It's Antichrist. That's what the deal is. Right? Right, right. And how many people today use modern versions? And there's a big internet YouTuber guy right now, right, using modern versions, right? And what does he and what does he not believe in? Eternal punishment of hell. So you don't think those modern versions have an influence on somebody? You better believe they do. They're absolutely antichrist. Let them be accursed. Is that too strong? Well, I'm not done yet. I might get stronger with it. Psalm 9:17: The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. What does the NIV say? The wicked returns to the grave and all nations that forget God. Wait a minute. Psalm 9:17 describes God's judgment upon the wicked. The judgment is not merely death in the grave, but eternal hell. It makes sense, does it? It makes sense if you understand the agenda and the conspiracy. Amen? If you understand that, you understand all of it. Proverbs 15, 24, the King James Bible says, The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. The NIV says, The path of life leads upward for the wise to keep him from going down to the grave. To translate this as the grave results in nonsense. The way of life does not keep one out of the grave. For as the point that a man wants to die, everybody's going to the grave. All right? Everybody's going to be buried. Unless, you know, we're taken up. Amen? The way of life refers to salvation that keeps the sinner out of hell. Not out of the grave. Listen, born again people that are in the way of life are going to die and go to the grave. They do every day. But they're not going to hell upon faith in Jesus Christ. See the difference? Isaiah 5, 14. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. The NIV, therefore the grave enlarges its appetite and opens its mouth without limit. It is not the grave, and David Cloud says this, he says, it's not the grave that is enlarged. How can the grave enlarge itself? <laughs> the grave just, there you go. It is hell beyond the grave that is enlarged because of man's stubborn hold to sin and rejection of God's salvation. 
Amen. Listen, folks, we're done. But how, how can, there's more that can be said. I mean, there's sermon after sermon. Nate, uh, Brother Paul, we could preach a hundred sermons on the differences in these books, right? Compared to the, the Word of God, compared to the King James Bible. The question you have to ask yourself, why would, the, wh- why would a version of the Bible leave out fasting and spiritual warfare? Why would they leave the weapons of our warfare out? Well, if you don't understand the agenda and who was on the translation committees, and two men like Westcott and Hort, and, and the others, we'll talk about Westcott and Hort someday. We'll do a radio show on Westcott and Hort directly. I mean, it just cover a lot of it. But, but when you understand the agenda here, there's two spirits in the world today, right? There's the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. Now, if I compare the King James Bible and I compare the other versions of the Bible, of, of, the, of the Bible, or supposed, to, supposed version of the Bible, what do I come up with? I come up, there is one spirit here, and then there's another with all these counterfeit versions. And I'm not going to war with a butter knife, but I want the sword. I want the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen? And you can't fight the devil without having the word of God. And you need the whole word of God, the complete word of God. If it's missing one verse, it's not the word of God. If it changes one verse, it's not the word of God. You've got to go with the sword into battle, and you've got to go with the sword of the Lord. Amen. Father, Lord, I pray you'd bless this and uh, help us understand the vital importance of the King James Bible. Now, you've blessed us with it and given it to us, Lord. And I thank God that even as a young boy, I was handed a King James Bible. And, Lord, I've never had anything else. I've never really read anything else. That I can remember if it maybe one or two times at a different church or something when I was a little kid. But Lord, I, the one I own, the one I picked up years later, 20 years of being a false convert, and 20 years later I picked up an old gift and award Bible, and it was the blessed book, the King James Bible. And Lord, you prepared my heart reading that for six months. I read that, and you saved my soul. And I thank you so much for it, Lord. Thank you that that preacher had a conviction for the King James Bible. He knew it, and he read it, and he taught it, and he believed it. And I thank God for him even this day. And help us, Lord, to be those people, people of the book, that King James Bible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.